Welcome again and good evening. Um, today's guest is Daniel Meissen from Kreuzwerker, who will solve one of the great secrets of the universe and explain to us why Atlassian Cloud and GDPR are best friends forever. I didn't even know that Atlassian Cloud had a best friend or the GDPR had even friends at all. But uh, today is the day that we are going to learn all that. And I am going to just disappear, Daniel, over to you. And I will see you on the other side. Well, then, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I'll, uh, so without further ado, um, let's dive right into the topic. Um, I will introduce myself and Kreuzberger uh, in brief. Um, after that, we look at the uh, different deployment options and uh, in particular at the different cloud plans that Atlassian had because it's not just cloud anymore, but different cloud plans that are tailored towards specific audiences. And we will quickly look at how to get into the cloud or get started with cloud, um, what the pricing um, of the different cloud offerings is. And then um, uh, close this up with the most relevant part for today, um, looking at compliance and trust and GDPR in particular. I'm Daniel Meisen. I'm shareholder and co-CEO of Kreuzberger, a Berlin-based uh, Atlassian partner with uh, additional offices in Munich, in the south of Germany, Zurich, Switzerland, and Warsaw. I'm an Atlassian expert by heart. Um, I'm certified instructor and professional. And I've been using Jira and Conference for quite some time uh, since the early days of my uh, university studies. Um, in addition to this, I work for Kreuzberger. Kreuzberger um, offers a wide array of professional services, mainly around uh, Atlassian services, full stack, implementing the tools, training tools, um, also operating the tools. We do a lot of what we call engineering, individual software development, um, in a very, very uh, wide array of programming languages as well. We do cloud operations. Um, we help our customers uh, operate their managed um, services uh, and, and also provide managed hosting offerings um, for different application stacks such as Atlassian. And we also do ideation and um, innovation consulting. We wouldn't be able to do all this without our partners. Uh, with AWS and Atlassian being uh, the biggest of them, but without further ado, there's a lot of uh, partners from the marketplace. Um, there's one logo on the very bottom right, um, Riada, which has been recently acquired by Atlassian. Um, so um, this is now an Atlassian native offering as well, um, or at least the products that Riada offered before. Let's look at the deployment options. Um, so when we're talking about Atlassian Cloud, um, we need to know that Atlassian Cloud is a native service hosted by Atlassian. Uh, Atlassian has been providing um, a managed hosting service of their products for quite some time, um, but only since a couple of years, it really is a native cloud service that has been built from the ground up um, as a dedicated set of high available tools operated by Atlassian. So you do not need more than just like um, swiping your credit card and getting started with Atlassian Cloud. In contrast to that, uh, you still have server and data center versions of the different products, mainly Jira and Confluence, uh, that you have to host either by yourself in your own data center, in your private cloud, or you get it as a managed service by Atlassian partners such as Kreuzberger. The different cloud plans um, have, been, um, have been grown over the years, uh, where we just have seen cloud standard um, for a couple of years um, with recent additions of cloud premium. So cloud premium a couple of years ago, um, and just as of this year, there's also a cloud enterprise plan. The main differentiator between those plans is the audience it is tailored for by adding um, professional services such an uptime, uh, such as an uptime SLA, premium support, um, or IP allow listing, cloud sandbox features, for example, uh, for the premium uh, cloud plan or um, enterprise that allows um, multi-site administration. Uh, org level insights and also has data residency control, which we're talking about in a few seconds again. It lessens, uh, positions the different offerings um, as cloud is fast to start up with. Um, you have reduced costs. Um, there's no need for you to roll an upgrade. 
So basically, Lessin is taking care of all the operational and product level upgrade aspects. Um, that means that uh, things such as security and compliance are basically built in and you can scale with confidence. So there is no need for you to uh, wrap your head around um, around uh, multi-node multi deployments or uh, scaling in or scaling up uh, your infrastructure uh, to allow a greater audience uh, or user base of your tools. Um, in contrast to that, for the servant data center tools, um, they still offer you advanced control, meaning you can, you can fine tune certain configuration settings. Um, you have full control over data locality and residency because you are deploying the tools yourself in whatever location you fancy. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of integrations. So you can integrate this with all the other on-prem uh, SAPs, Active Directories, Tableaus, or whatever you fancy for. Um, the main differenti differentiator here between server and data center is basically scale and high availability. Um, so if you fancy certain data center only features such as archiving or read-only mode, you might come up with uh, single node data center deployments. Um, but if you are looking at zero downtime deployments um, or zero downtime upgrades um, and other high availability features, um, you're looking at a multi-node data center deployment all on your own, basically. So let's, let's look at how you get to the cloud. Um, so if you're basically starting with a fresh cloud instance, um, which the majority of users are probably uh, still looking at a certain backlog or certain legacy less in stack that they have either on-prem or um, other systems that did the job in the past and will now be replaced with the less in tools. There's certainly a certain workload that you might want to migrate to the cloud. And there's different scenarios to do this. Um, so you might be able to move all at once, depending on the size, to a brand new cloud instance. You might want to split and federate uh, certain, um, certain tools um, or based on certain projects um, to multiple cloud, um, new cloud environments or instances. Or you can do this project by project into established uh, cloud instances that you already operate um, more or less in a mixed mode. Or, um, and this is a use case that we're seeing quite often, uh, with existing customers, uh, you might find more than one single at less in deployment at your organization and then you uh, consider merging and consolidating all this into one single cloud instance. Um, so there's one uh, question um, that I'm answering right away. Um, how do you see the future of server data center environments with Jira and Atlassian? Uh, as Atlassian is pushing the pure cloud solution so massive, I guess there's a plan to go away from server DC. So um, Atlassian has been investing a lot in its cloud offering in the past and will do so uh, over the future years, I'm, I'm pretty certain. Um, that means that Atlassian is uh, shifting towards a, um, uh, let's say, SaaS, only or at least a very uh, strong SaaS company in the future. Um, so there's definitely, and if we're looking at, at Germany in particular or continental Europe with all its uh, legal and regulatory requirements, there will be server and data center deployments um, around for quite some time in the future. But rest assured, um, I guess the future for Atlassian and also for a lot of deployment bases will be cloud. So there is no, um, yeah, there's no way of, of not acknowledging that. I hope this answers your question. If not, just follow up with that. Um, so the regular phases of a migration um, is basically uh, the same uh, for most of the stacks if you're not really looking at very, very tiny installation bases, meaning you will need to assess um, uh, what you have um, and, and what you want to migrate. Um, you will need to create a plan on, on how to get to the cloud. You will need to prepare this. You will need to run a test migration. And then uh, once this is done, um, you will actually uh, run a migration and then on launch day, make sure that, uh, that all goes well. Um, and ideally, you either, um, if you do this on your own, which is perfectly fine and Lessin has invested heavily in tooling that allows you to do this, um, you need to or should involve um, Atlassian support so that you can actually be sure to have someone on site assisting you during the migration. If not, um, there's plenty of partners around um, that will be happy to assist you um, in all your migration efforts. 
Um, so this is, for example, uh, the Jira cloud migration or the, the Confluence uh, cloud migration assistant, um, which is basically native tools uh, that you can install via the marketplace, similar to other add-ons that will assess your current configuration and um, application base or add-on base um, that you have installed and will help you planning a migration towards um, the Atlassian native cloud offerings. Meaning that you can see um, what of the add-ons uh, you're currently using uh, have a native replacement from the same vendor um, or um, there is something that you might want to retire or where, where you basically find a more suitable uh, add-on that, that covers nearly the same use case for you um, in cloud. And this is something that you can uh, note down here and then end up with a migration plan um, that you can use for a production migration. As always, um, some spring cleaning might help. So the, uh, the less content you actually need to migrate, um, the, yeah, let's say the, 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 there are lesser degrees um, of freedom for your migration that might turn out into uh, errors that you might have to correct afterwards. So spring cleaning before the migration is actually something that, uh, that definitely helps and benefits to a smooth migration uh, day. Let's look at the pricing. Um, because usually, um, and, and very uh, early on, um, once you started having the, the discussions um, towards um, is server cheaper versus is uh, cloud cheaper, um, you end up with just comparing license cost. And uh, if you look at the, the pure license price, um, you see that, uh, that uh, the green and uh, the red lines, which is cloud premium and cloud standard, um, they are mostly cheaper for up to 100 users and they get more expensive for higher user tires. Um, but this is only half of the truth because in the end, um, what you should be looking at is the batteries included price, um, meaning the total cost of ownership. And if you can compare um, the native cloud offering, um, all you basically pay for your application stack is the su subscription fee um, for your cloud plan plus whatever you have in terms of administration support, either by a partner or internally, because you have uh, application owners and application administrators in your organization that will run the stack for you. Um, if you're looking at a self-managed stack, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, hidden or sunk costs for implementation, for maintenance, for all the change management around, for keeping track of security and privacy running the upgrades on the application level, um, on dependency level, on infrastructure level, and last but not least, making sure the whole stack stays performant and uh, up to date. And these are all costs that you need to take into consideration when actually comparing costs between uh, cloud and server. And um, this means that the total cost of ownership is relatively um, cheaper for uh, Atlassian Cloud in the majority of use cases. And uh, Atlassian actually wants you to migrate to the cloud, um, which is uh, uh, not only because um, they are investing heavily in its cloud offering, but they will also um, uh, allow you to benefit from, uh, yeah, from, from certain discounts or um, uh, rewards uh, for, for actually migrating to the cloud. May it be free extended cloud trial licenses, so you don't have to double pay a cloud and a server or data center license um, for the time you uh, hold an active maintenance for any of the server data center products. Or if you um, decide to migrate over the cloud um, before the end of your maintenance period, uh, there's discounts for unused maintenance, um, for example. Um, and of course, there's also academic and community licenses um, that might be an incentive for you. So let's look at the more interesting um, part for today, compliance and trust. So um, if you have been uh, looking at the Atlassian Cloud uh, tools and if you are a European customer, um, there's a very high chance that you've come across uh, the Atlassian Trust Center, um, which will outline certain aspects around uh, security, privacy and compliance, reliability and scale, but also um, the controls and support. Um, this means that if uh, you have well, your internal data protection officer or an external entity doing this for you, you might have checked um, at least the data processing addendum, but probably also additional sources on that. And Atlassian is very transparent in, in what it actually has in regards to compliance. So all the, uh, the active certifications may it be uh, PCI DSS, SOC 2, SOC 3, or uh, ISO 27K. 
so all these um, uh, certification results and uh, partially also the reports are shared uh, for customer uh, use on the trust center. Um, so it's pretty, um, actually it's pretty interesting uh, to just look at them because it gives you a lot of insights at, uh, at how cloud is actually managed and, and how cloud is built and what controls Atlassian has implemented um, to run the Atlassian cloud stack for its customers. So we're here today to look at um, the status quo GDPR. Um, and I've built these slides um, for a pretty similar webinar um, before the um, court decision on uh, Schrems 2. Um, so with Privacy Shield um, still intact. I need to give you a little disclaimer, meaning the following statements, they have been carefully reviewed by me. I am not a lawyer and this should not be treated as legal advice. Um, so just take this advice as uh, very general and not uh, my personal, professional or uh, legal advice, so to say. The status quo um, for GDPR compliance means Atlassian has been providing and is still continuing to provide a standard data protection addendum. And this data uh, protection addendum covers all requirements that the GDPR has in terms of data subjects, categories of data, the purpose of processing, as well as um, all the involved sub-processors and the duties based on Article 32 to 36 of the GDPR. So this is actually good news because um, technically this is with very few limitations all you need um, to be GDPR compliant because it also includes all the technical and organizational measures. So is it all well then? Well, um, there are certain things that, uh, that are lacking in the uh, data processing addendum itself, such as for example data protection by default, um, or certain data residency controls. Um, but all of these are available um, depending on the plan that you actually intend to buy. Um, so enterprise, standard or uh, premium, for example, or um, they might differ um, based on region. And, and these, these information is all available through certain, um, yeah, certain documents that Alessian is sharing. It will also give you uh, an overview of what content um, uh, is basically shared across or transferred across um, uh, different jurisdictions and different countries by default. Um, what internal controls and audits uh, Atlassian um, is pursuing, um, how the data privacy management is set up and how incident and response management is set up. You will find all of these um, information publicly available on Atlassian sites. And the most important documents are definitely the data processing addendum that I just mentioned um, as well as the cloud terms of service, um, for example, for the um, uh, data protection management by default. Um, you will have the trust center that outlines certain compliance and certification in regard to ISO, for example. And um, uh, you have full transparency of how Atlassian has implemented uh, access control by its employees on customer data meaning that all the data uh, is encrypted at rest and uh, in transit, but you still might want to know how it's set up um, and who has access to the encryption keys, for example. And for enterprise particularly, there is also a document outlining um, how you can manage data residency controls in the enterprise plan. So what kind of control you have over certain aspects of the data. So for the, for the general um, cloud user, this should be okay um, up until uh, the SRAMS 2 ruling. Um, for highly regulated environments, um, such as finance, insurance, or healthcare providers, um, or if you are working in an environment that's had, uh, that has um, additional compliance requirements, um, such as TSAGs or BDA, ISA, which are very dominant um, in the automotive sector, for example, or if you have certain requirements on data residency controls, you might need to know that there's certain centralization of user account data, um, for example, for Atlassian ID. Um, you might also be interested in um, the multi-geography use if you are in uh, any non-enterprise and uh, enterprise plan, um, because Atlassian basically moves the data where the majority of your users are. And if you are basically having users um, coming 50% from the US and 50% from the EU, um, you might want to know where the data actually um, is hold for you. 
It also depends on the product portfolio. So for example, if, uh, if we're looking at the core products, um, Jira Confluence, for example, um, the information that I just uh, outlined is different than, for example, um, for Obstgeny or Status Page, because with Obstgeny, you already have data residency controls um, to a very large degree by signing up. Um, you can pick the realm or the region um, where uh, your data or the, let's say that the primary usage data um, should be stored. You might also be interested in looking at the third party apps that we use. And depending on how or if and how they will process your data, you might be obliged to uh, sign certain DPAs uh, with marketplace vendors in addition to the DPA that you signed with Atlassian for the core products. Um, this is something where you might want to look up Forge afterwards because Atlassian um, has been launching a new development framework um, uh, called Forge that will provide the, uh, the operational environment for add-ons um, hosted by the same security and compliance standard as the core products um, and will be carried out by Atlassian. So this is still something in, uh, in beta stadium and nothing that is generally available as of now, but it's uh, showing the direction where things are going. You've probably um, joined this webinar to hear something about the current ruling um, post privacy shield. Um, so as you might have heard in the news, um, there has been a, a EU court ruling that invalidated um, the privacy shield. Um, so there is technically no legal ground uh, for transferring personal data between the EU and uh, US as of now. Um, but in the same, basically in the same ruling, um, the court validated um, or confirmed um, standard contract clauses, which are already uh, incorporated in the Atlassian data processing addendum uh, to be a valid me mechanism for data transfers between the EU and the US, which in general is not assumed to be sufficient on its own but in combination um, with uh, additional terms or additional certifications or additional assessments or in combination with additional binding corporate rules, um, it might form a legal ground um, for achieving GDPR compliance. Um, but still, um, you cannot just continue to use the tools you have been, you have been using the tools um, and, and assume GDPR compliance uh, just by the pure nature. Um, so technically, you would have to conduct a um, additional um, analysis and a so-called Datenschutzfolgeabschätzung in German, um, which is one word that basically translates to data protection impact assessment. So you have to um, look at your particular use case um, and assess uh, the transfer of data and data subjects and come to the conclusion on your own. Um, so we as Kreuzberger um, have been trying uh, to help our customers um, by um, teaming up with a couple of um, uh, data privacy lawyers and doing a, a model Datenschutzfolgenabschätzung, so basically a, a template um, data protection impact assessment that can be used for the majority um, of similar use cases um, to use the Atlassian cloud or native cloud offerings in a, a GDPR compliant fashion. Um, this still means that if you are from any of the, uh, let's say, edge, cage, uh, edge case environments that I mentioned before, um, so financial insurance uh, or healthcare providers, you might still uh, need to do additional steps to actually achieve this. Um, one thing that is also very relevant um, when looking at the certification is seeing where things are heading. Um, and this is, uh, this is also something where Atlassian has been uh, very transparent um, in the past and also as of today by sharing its cloud platform and service roadmap. Um, so you can directly see what is ahead um, and what is currently being implemented. So obviously there's no delivery dates for each of these features, um, but rest assured, um, if there's something flagged that's coming soon, um, uh, it's, it's not uh, going, going to supposed to take years um, uh, to reach general availability, um, but will be around um, in a meaningful time frame. So uh, let's call it a wrap. Um, Atlassian has invested a lot in its native cloud um, and offers a lot um, of different plans tailored to different audiences with cloud enterprise being uh, one of the newest, addition, um, uh, newest additions to the plans um, and featuring native data residency control. So um, GDPR compliance can be assumed based on the model clauses or standard contract clauses um, uh, by including additional certifications and assessments. 
um, or binding copy rules. Um, you should always look at the additional um, documentation and certification um, if you are tasked with uh, assessing GDPR compliance and if you're working in highly regulated environments, um, there's also additional aspects that need consideration. So for example, um, AWS has been providing a financial and insurance addendum um, uh, to cover the regulatory requirements by the German Financial um, uh, Regulation Authority, BaFin. And this is something um, where we've been seeing a lot of, um, let's say, a, a lot of noise. So this is something that we probably can, can expect something in the future uh, as well. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, if there's questions, just use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. There's one already pasted there. Um, so let's, uh, let me quickly uh, read it out. Uh, Feature-wise cloud is- I will in the meantime promote and everybody to the panel so that you yeah. can- Yeah, good idea. Thanks, Jörg. So um, feature-wise cloud is not a one-on-one -on -one replacement of server with a lot of many additional features. Some features are not present. Also many of the add-ons are not available on cloud. Um, so how do you look uh, at a lesson moving away from server and what will the timelines um, that organizations should look at moving to the cloud? So that's a very good question that, that we're getting asked by a lot of existing um, server and data center customers as of now. Um, the, the Jira uh, and Confluence Cloud um, migration toolkits allow you to assess the current coverage of add-ons by the same vendor. So um, we've been seeing the marketplace growing and the, the growth rates for cloud add-ons is definitely higher for server um, and data center add-ons, meaning there is new add-ons coming on a more or less daily uh, rate. Um, obviously, there are certain features um, that will not be ported at all. Um, because they might not make sense in, uh, in, in, in a cloud environment or a native cloud environment. Um, but especially if you're looking at add-on vendors, um, uh, for, the, for the bigger ones, um, they will all uh, be working on getting their native, um, uh, their native or core products uh, migrated to the clouds, um, uh, cloud environments if the APIs allow. Um, so also the, uh, the Atlassian uh, APIs for Jira Confluence, they are completely different um, uh, when comparing server to data center and, uh, and, and the cloud offerings. So this is something where add-on vendors might just be limited in porting the functionality. But in general, um, uh, I would assume that uh, just starting now and running uh, POCs or proof of concepts um, for assessing, let's say, your cloud readiness um, is something that you can do on the side without any, um, uh, let's say, without any production impact and, and any impairments. And with the incentives that a lesson is providing you by providing you a, a tire match license for a cloud stack, it's also relatively, um, cheap in, in, in terms of, well, license cost at all, but still you might want to invest some labor there on your own. Okay, thank you. Okay. So any more questions? Can you, I can stop share your screen? Yes, I will stop uh, okay. my screen. That would be great. So um, questions from the audience, you can ask directly or you can just type it in the Q&A box if you do not want to be recorded. Um, and while we are waiting for the first brave person. Yeah, so um, while we're waiting for the first brave person, there's, there's one last sentence I'd like to share. So this Datenschutzfolgenabschätzung is a behemoth of a document. So we've been in the process for quite some time. We started um, a few months ago um, and we're still working on this. Um, uh, so rest assured that once we have a presentable version um, of this data impact, uh, data protection impact assessment, um, we will share it um, well, with the lesson, but also through our uh, channels, uh, such as our blog, for example. Okay. Uh, no, the Q&A box is not locked. You should be able to ask questions. Um, if it doesn't work, just use the chat and we use to we, we use we use the chat. We read from the chat. But then in principle you should be able to um, to use the QA box. I have a question. Um, so but the prop the, the point right now is uh, a data impact assessment, um, data protection impact assessment, like that. Um, that's not something that you do over a weekend. Uh, it's something that takes time um, and you shouldn't do it alone. That's the basic 
thing now. And and what and as far as I understood, Privacy Shield and the Privacy Shield decision, um, the decision basically removed the option of not having one. So you should have one right now and start it as soon as yes. possible if you stay in the cloud. Is that, so this, is, is that? this is basically something uh, that, that the ruling in its very course says is um, you need to do an assessment. So it doesn't, it doesn't technically say um, how, uh, let's say how, how broad or, or how deep this assessment needs to go, um, but you need to assess your use of um, any uh, software as a service that might transfer data outside of the EU. Um, and uh, as, as I said, like this, uh, this data protection impact assessment in, in, the, in the form that we are conducting it is very comprehensive and um, uh, will cover basically a wide array of use cases um, uh, to, to function or to form um, as a template um, for our customers, but, but also for others and, and users um, of the Elastic Cloud. Okay. Um. Here's a question I only have. You have no open questions and can't answer questions there. So, however, um, I see issues with cloud add-ons as most add-ons storing a lot of data in the add-on in the add-on provider and not at Atlassian. So, separate storages for add-ons and for Atlassian. So, this is something that, um, that as I mentioned in, uh, in, in one of the slides, um, you need to look um, at the, the add-on vendor and also um, at, uh, let's say, the functionality a certain add-on provides. Um, because in the end, um, uh, this will tell you if there is any uh, data processing done by, um, by the add-on vendor. There are certain add-ons that just add functionality um, without actually um, um, transferring or processing your data outside of the Atlassian tools. Um, but on the other hand, there are certainly um, uh, add-ons with a deeper functionality that will do this. And um, when, once you assess uh, your GDPR compliance in regards to, uh, to the Atlassian uh, native cloud products, this is something that, that you need to look at as well, yes. And that's, uh, that's something that you have to differentiate. Um, if the add-on is, is, uh, is adding uh, an additional service, and some of them do, like OpsGenie, for example. OpsGenie is an additional service, um, and there are tons of others, um, or that are just a bridge to another platform, like let's say ServiceNow integration or whatever. Um, you have, of course, to check the target uh, service for this add-on if they are compliant as well. And you are right that there's currently no labeling like, um, um, there's no labeling um, like with food stuff. Is this something that you have to check? Can you eat that or not? Um, and Git and, and the, you mentioned specifically Git add-on providers. So yes, if you have a Git add-on, there's always a Git in the background. Uh, it doesn't work without that. So and you have to check where the Git is. Um, and Git is a separate database. So. Um, Atlassian does not have an included Git database or Git repository. I don't know what that's. Okay, that's not what you mean. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> that's the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, then maybe it's easier. I just ask the question yes. uh, with this one. Um, yeah, um, the, the point is not uh, that there's some Git where the source is stored, but um, uh, most add-on providers, for example, that are integrate. For example, our company has some Git uh, repository at Azure DevOps, uh, and we know that uh, our source code is stored there, and we have also Azure Cloud um, uh, using. And then I installed some integration plugin that will show the commits, for example, and uh, what branches are available uh, in Atlassian, mm -hmm. the cloud. And it was not mentioned, and uh, it was a little bit of research to find out that the provider most uh, Git uh, plugins cloning the source from Azure DevOps to their own servers uh, to create this views. Yeah. And that is really some problem that is um, a little bit uh, related to the architecture of uh, uh, Atlassian Cloud because previously all these add-ons 
that, for example, create and Git integration uh, are able to store data directly uh, in the uh, Jira database uh, or store just data in their own database because they just run as a Java plugin on the same server. And because it is now not possible uh, anymore, of course, of uh, uh, data protection, <laughs> Uh, Jira uh, or Atlassian does not allow uh, code running code anymore on um, on the cloud. Um, the companies um, are needed to store the data somewhere, and most of the companies then just yeah r run some own servers where then they store sometimes data they not really mentioned what they store there. Um, I asked a lot of these companies w how the data is stored and most of them lied me uh, the first time and say no we don't store the data and uh, asking more and intensively how they uh, create these views and so on then say yeah yeah but that is uh, it's uh, safe we store this on uh, AVS servers in the U United States nobody can uh, can access them. So that is really something uh, everyone that use cloud add-ons has to check what what the add-on does, uh, what data it stores some, somewhere, and uh, especially for this Git thing, it's not always correct what uh, what's written on the the websites there. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a, the whole the whole add-on topic, Daniel. Um, you want to have your opinion on that. It's kind of an open construction site. There is some, there is now some verification or some, there is this, this um, certificate that Atlassian gives you if you have tested your code uh, for security leaks, if you are in the cloud, but there's still no, as far as I'm aware, general framework um, that, um, like in the Apple App Store, that you have to go through a certain regiment where you store your data, what access you have before you're allowed on the app store. That's still a work in progress as far as I know. So this is basically that there's two, um, two streams that we might be, or might be worth looking at. So the first definitely is Forge, um, which basically provides add-on vendors, especially if they are smaller add-on vendors with an operational environment for the add-ons that, it, uh, that is provided by Atlassian um, with the same security and compliance requirements uh, uh, than the Atlassian uh, uh, cloud products have. So um, we, actually, sorry, we have actually have a video from last week. Uh, Forge is basically a function as a service um, platform run by Atlassian and you can see examples and how that coding works uh, yeah. in last week's video. Exactly. And this is basically an advantage for, for smaller marketplace vendors. Like um, if you look at the marketplace, um, there's a large variety of, of add-on shops rain, ranging from one or two person companies um, up to proper companies um, with hundreds of employees. Um, and, and it definitely helps them in bootstrapping their add-ons by, by not applying some shady mechanisms um, of processing your data unsecured on some AWS service or wherever, as you just mentioned. So this is something where, where you as the user definitely has to invest some time in due diligence by selecting those providers. And then in the end, um, uh, if, uh, if like Forge is not generally available, as, as I mentioned, um, so in, in the current state, um, this is something where the data processing addendum of those um, of those marketplace uh, vendors um, have to match actually the subjects and uh, also the the means of processing for what they're currently doing. And if it's not, well, actually you have a case there um, because um, th this is still something that that you need to get an agreement on. Um, and as Jörg said, so that there is uh, the bug bounty program, the security and compliance programs um, for add-on vendors, and I'm pretty sure. Um, even though uh, I haven't had any or haven't seen any any official news about this, um, uh, there might be something like a uh, GDPR compliance or compliance badge for add-on uh, providers that have proved their compliance um, with the GDPR or other frameworks um, towards Atlassian so that not every user has to do its own due diligence in the end. Yeah. So this is something that would help definitely, yes. And to, uh, to Atlassian's... Um rescue or whatever you want to call it. Um, if you look at their standard contract clauses, they are not going the easy way here. So they chose um, basically voluntarily 
uh, the strictest uh, data protection guidance that you can find in the US, which is the California Data Protection Act, um, which is as close to the GDPR as you can get in the US. So data protection law in the U United States is a mess because it's not a federal law, it's state law and only half of the states have anything and the federal level has nothing. So, but among these 28 states that have something, the California Data Protection Act is by far the strictest. Um, and you can find comparison tables between GDPR and, and CDP, CCDPA, uh, which show that it's very close. So um, Atlassian is not only bound by GDPR, but has bound itself by the California Data Protection Act. So they are moving very quickly in that direction because they have to. And uh, they are now no longer, they are a billion dollar company, billion plus. So uh, they don't have room, too much room for error there because the, 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 punish, punish, the, the, um, no, the punishments under CCT, CCTPA are also uh, not cheap. So if you are getting caught under that regulation, that's not cheap either. Maybe not expensive as GDPR, but not cheap either. There's a question or Bernard, yeah. open yeah. the microphone. Yeah. Bernard, yeah. Um, Daniel, question. Does uh, Atlassian give some guidance also to app vendors um, how to fulfill all the rules and regulations? So something we as an add-on provider we are, could take and apply to a certain extent, not to run in problems with customers and I'm complaining later on about yeah, data problems and so on, as yeah, we discussed so, right um, now. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is, um, uh, and there has been uh, as early as uh, before May 2018, when the GDPR came into place, um, there has been guidelines for add-on vendors, um, especially of incorporating um, uh, GDPR-related uh, functionalities. So, for example, um, uh, one thing that you must, uh, must need to ensure is that whenever you receive a request of removing data for a certain user because an employee has left the company or it's actually uh, uh, end customer or end user data that, that you have processed in, in a service desk uh, fashion, for example. Um, you have to make sure that, that all related data to that person um, is either pseudonymized or removed. And the lesson has implemented a lot of APIs ensuring that, uh, especially for add-on vendors. And there is certain guidelines around these GDPR uh, tailored APIs but also on a general level available on the Atlassian developer community, but also in the partner portal um, available um, if you are a registered marketplace vendor, for example. And I will share the, the, the link there. They also depreciated quite a few API, call, API calls that would allow you to uh, get user data. Uh, there's a special section about um, API calls being depreciated because of GDPR. Yeah. in the cloud. So um, I can share the link with that in the show notes. Uh, so there's a whole section in the developer documentation about which API calls are no longer available because of GDPR. So there's some stuff going on. We have a question in the, does that answer your question, Bernard, or anything else? Yeah, I think if you can share the links, it would be great. Yeah. And just about the comment on Forge, uh, we, we checked it also if Forge can fulfill our, our functionality needs. And so this is a pity that it does not at the moment, maybe later in the future. Um, yeah, we have to live with the situation, I guess. And yeah. Yeah. let's see what Atlassian can provide us here and how we deal in the best way. Most of the thing is the best to store only configurations on our side and anonymize data. Um, I think that's a good solution here. Yeah. Thanks so far. Uh, I, we had quite a few add-on vendors in our Monday events. Uh, Botron among them and, and uh, people who have quite extensive, who do make quite extensive use of the APIs. Um, and they all had the same uh, verdict. Um, we cannot go into the cloud because the API on the server is not the same. That will take some time and it will probably not be the same. So, and I agree with the comment in the chat that Forge will probably be the way forward or something like Forge. So maybe they will add something to Forge that is not function as a service, but uh, I don't know, some Kubernetes thingy that allows you to deploy a container. Awesome. And, yeah, whatever. Um, as a service. Yeah, something like that. So, but um, 
And again, the question for the time horizon, um, but let's say now has a lot of money. So if they want to do th something, they can do it. They have two and a half billion in cash. So, um, and they really, really, really want to have you in the cloud. So time horizon is difficult to say. We have asked Atlassian themselves. We had uh, Lauren Harrison here from the uh, cloud platform team or was formerly cloud platform team. And we asked her, what's the time horizon? When do we don't, when, when are we not going to have a server anymore? And of course they do not say, but, um, and we are still talking years, not months. So next one year at least, maybe two. So, but there are no, uh, no guarantees that can go, can go very quickly because as I said, at Lessin and now has a, quite a lot of cash at hand. And if they want to do something quickly, they have the resources. So yeah. that's also the, because of the, the importance of cloud um, and the, the, the size of the European yes. uh, market, or at least the market the GDPR applies to, um, there, there is just a certain pressure of, of being GDPR compliant as good as possible. Yeah. Um, and, and enabling customers um, uh, to migrate to the cloud um, as easy as possible. Um, so rest assured, uh, this uh, has gained a lot of traction, not only um, within uh, partners or Atlassian partners such as us, but, but also within Atlassian um, and is uh, debated a lot internally. Yeah, and, uh, but what the only thing that's, that's uh, speaking for server and data center right now, server and data center is still a little bit more than 50% of revenue. Uh, the vast majority of customers, I don't know, they have 175,000 customers and 160 something thousand are in the cloud, but only 50% of revenue. So 49% of revenue are in the cloud, 51 is still in server. So they cannot just switch it off, um, especially with the ruling in Europe, um, that would be not very good. Um, Daniel, have you heard anything about the data uh, residency feature being available outside of the enterprise license? We have asked that question, but we haven't heard anything back now until now. So um, nothing officially. Uh, let, let's say this question has been asked a lot internally. How about um, making uh, data privacy controls um, available in other plans or uh, optionally as a paid feature in other plans? Um, but as of today, there is no official statement from Atlassian to do this. So data residency controls are available in enterprise. Um, uh, one of the links in the slide deck um, shows how this is implemented and what kind of control this gives you. Um, but uh, there is no official statement yet um, in regards to making this available in other plans as well. And pricing for enterprise licenses is also still not available. Not, not yet, not generally, available. Uh, no. Mm. Okay. So um, that is still, yeah, suspenseful, to put it mildly. Thank you very much for uh, well, bearing with us and yeah. uh, sh sharing that amount of time with us. Um, yeah. And if there's any questions coming up afterwards, um, so the slide deck also contains um, my, my contact data, um, feel free to reach out either to the community or uh, to me or Kreuzberger. Perfect, thank you, Daniel. Have a nice evening. Yeah. And to end, on a, to end on a positive note, uh, the privacy shield with Switzerland is still intact. So because the privacy shield was for the United <laughs> States and Switzerland, but uh, the privacy shield with Switzerland is still intact. So if you have a cloud in Switzerland, you're on the safe side. No problems there. So, okay. <laughs> See you around. Bye. Bye-bye.